Hello sailors, this is the Dodger Kebab, and Konami suck. But back in the day, Konami were one of the best developers in the world, and I want to talk about Konami when they were loved by gamers, and not the crusty wank sock that they've become today. It's pretty safe to say that between the periods of 1981 and 2001, Konami were on fire. They just kept on releasing utter bangers. After this, they blew off original ideas and went full throttle into sequels and established IPs. Sad, really. It's like someone you know who was really cool and fun to be around, but now they've got some sort of mental disease and all they do is shit the bed and throw up over themselves. So let's look back at the good times. Konami's first real banger came in 1981 with the release of Frogger, a simple arcade game where you had to control a frog and move him and his four buddies across a busy road and a river that somehow flowed in more than one direction. You must get all five frogs into the safety zones at the top of the screen, avoid the traffic on the road and don't fall in the water. Which raises the question, what sort of pussy frogs are these? One of the key features of frogs is that they're amphibians, which are more than well suited to being in water. By putting that stupidity aside this is still a fun little five minute game even now but in 1981 it was hugely popular and from here the quality only gets better In 1983 brought happiness to gamers, but distress to game controllers with the release of Hyper Olympic. But in the West, this would be known as track and field. The OG button mashing game had you slamming the plastic faster than a lonely woman with a rampant rabbit. 100 meter spring, long jump, javelin, 110 meter hurdles, hammer throw, and high jump were the events you'd compete in for record scores. And you were competing with everyone else who had played that cabinet because this was one of the first arcade games to actually save the scores and records people got. This all added up to track and field becoming a smash hit and receiving a few home ports to the systems of the time. Here in England, the most famous port was actually an unlicensed ripoff called Daily Thompson's Decathlon. Everyone who had a ZX Spectrum in the mid 80s had this game and the amount of joysticks this title killed is immeasurable and the controller destroying properties of this game was basically an 80s British meme at the time. But let's just look how much of this is a blatant ripoff of track and field. The name entry screen, character sprite, winning animation, game mechanics, power bar, it's the same fucking game. As they're both pretty much the same thing, both are fantastic games. a game about being a dude and bum thrusting girls off their seats in class? Well then, Mikey is the Konami game you've been waiting for. Originally released as This game had you running around a school collecting hearts from girls and jars for some reason and it had you doing this to an 8-bit version of the Beatles classic A Hard Day's Night. This game is literally harder than Dark Souls, and just getting out the first room is a major task. Anyway, it was a semi-popular hit with various home ports that were made to the machines at the time, all which looked like... <coughs> The amount of quality games starts ramping up now with three classics in one year alone. First of all we have Gradius, also known as Nemesis, and also known as if you lose your power ups, you're fucked. This classic shoot 'em up combined great graphics, superb sounds and controls tighter than a nun snatch to create an instant classic and the beginning of a long lasting series of games. Also this year came another brilliant shoot 'em up game. This time was Konami's Twin Bee, one of the first in the cute 'em up genre and it adopted a different method of scrolling over Gradius, i.e. it went upwards. Just like
like Gradius, it was also an instant classic and would become the beginning of a whole series of games and would later join together with Gradius to form the Parodia series of games. The third great game to come from Konami this year wasn't a shoot 'em up, but rather one of the earliest fighting games. This is Yi Ha Kung Fu, and you would control Oolong as you battle fat guys, bitches with stars, assholes with nunchucks, this prick with a pole, Fiedel, who's just a waste of time, Chain, who's just pole in different clothes, and Club, who was just made out of Invincible. Unless you played the Spectrum version where you could actually beat him and get to Fan, who would then kick the shit out of you. This is when Konami put on its big boy pants and started making decent original home console games itself. You know this game as Castlevania, but back in 1986, this was first released on the Famicom Disk System as... I'm not going to bother explaining this game because everyone in the whole world knows what it's all about already and you don't need me to tell you something you've heard a million times already. Also this year, Konami decided that they really liked swimming in all the money they made from Gradius, so they decided to make another shoot 'em up that was similar. This is the arcade version of Salamander and just like Gradius, you flew across the screen but also featured levels where you flew upwards like in Twin B. The main difference between this and Gradius is that this game has much better graphics and by default is played in fuck off hard mode. By the time you get to level 3 and fire is jumping out the top and bottom of the screen, it's clear that this game wants to kill you. Konami continued making great original home console games this year with the release of Metal Gear on the Famicom. Hideo Kojima's breakthrough title hooked players with its brilliant gameplay and shameless cover art lifted directly from the first Terminator movie. Try not to wake the dogs, sneak past people, receive radio messages from HQ and sneak onto trucks. The other big game this year was the arcade release of Contra. Control Lance or Bill in this excellent run and gun shooter. Although most people know this game from the NES version, released at a later date to the arcade version. Obviously the coin-up version is superior in every way, but on the NES version, Konami once again ripped the game box artwork directly from another Arnold Schwarzenegger film, Predator. What was wrong with Konami during this time period? This is their arcade game, The Main Event, and this is the promotional material to go with it. That is a blatant copy of Hulk Hogan, and this is a shamelessly unlicensed Andre the Giant. Utter thievery aside, this late 80s wrestling game was actually pretty good, but when you look at other wrestling games at the time, like WWF on the NES, which was fucking unplayable, then you'll see why The Main Event was so well received. Did Konami release anything of worth in 1989? Oh yeah, there was that one game. Konami absolutely smashed it with the release of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You have to remember that the world was experiencing turtle mania at this point. The cartoon was huge, the toys were selling by the bucket load, and then Konami took this hype and worked it into a fantastic arcade game which everyone wanted to play. This game was in every arcade when I was a kid, and always the same scenario played out. Either you got to play as Michelangelo or Donatello, which had controls positioned so you could actually see what was on the screen or you got shafted into being Leonardo or Raphael and just had to fucking guess what was going on. Months later magazines started to run this advert and people were hyped. Konami was creating a Ninja Turtle game for home machines but instead of porting this game Konami said fuck you you get this barely functioning piece of shit which is nothing like the arcade game. Up yours. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
a new decade and new era in gaming had begun. Parodius was a shoot 'em up Konami had made for the MSX home computer a few years prior, but now Konami took another stab at the concept in 1990 with the release of Parodius Da in the arcade. Parodius combined Gradius and Twinbee to make a shoot 'em up that was batshit crazy. Where else would you see a cat that is actually a flying pirate boat? a special weapon that shoots out Japanese words to wipe out bad guys, or a boss that is actually an exotic dancer. Outside of this madness, this is a brilliant game with great controls and far more forgiving than something like Salamander. <laughs> In 1991, Konami took the formula that had worked so well for the Ninja Turtles and applied it to The Simpsons, a side-scrolling beat-em-up that allowed for four players. It followed the previous game so closely that even the feature on the cabinet that made two players basically unplayable was here too. You'd expect this to be the best game that Konami would release in 1991, but it wasn't. Konami also put out Sunset Riders, a Wild West-style shooting game fantastic game which found a decent size audience big enough to warrant home conversions a few years later did this game lift gameplay mechanics from namco's rolling thunder 2 from the previous year yes but i don't care and neither does anyone else this would have been konami's game of the year had it not been for the other banger that they released in the arcade the criminally underrated vendetta if you only look at it for a few seconds you could be forgiven for thinking that it was just a final fight clone but it's much more than that there is a far greater level of interactive here. Some mobs will try to hide from you, weapons have environmental effects, and items can have unexpected outcomes on enemies. The core fighting gameplay is really satisfying, with punches and kicks having a great sense of impact behind them. There are a lot of ideas and variation on offer, and the best thing is that each area is just the right length and doesn't drag on. Vendetta is up there with the likes of Streets of Rage 2, and it's a shame that no one ever talks about this. I'm inclined to agree with you, dodgy kebab. <laughs> Two notable things happened this year with Konami. The first was the release of the rather brilliant Asterix arcade game. You play as one of two well-known French characters and surprisingly don't spend the whole game retreating from enemies and running away. Instead, you have this really fun walk-along beat-em-up that's got some nice cartoon-style graphics and enjoyable gameplay. Some really interesting sections are thrown in every so often to keep the player's engagement going. The other key thing is that a group of talented developers pitch their idea for gun star heroes to the bosses at Konami and got blown out so instead of forgetting about the game idea they told Konami to get fucked and form their own studio called Treasure. So Konami lost a small group of key development staff and as Treasure these guys created some absolutely brilliant titles obviously Gunstar Heroes but Dynamite Heady and Alien Soldier too. <laughs> Rocket Knight Adventures released in 1993, proving that despite losing a few key staff members, Konami was still more than capable of releasing hit games. Released exclusively for the Sega Mega Drive, you take control of this rocket-powered rodent. Well, I'm saying rodent, just what the hell animal is Rocket Knight? Players control Sparkster, an opossum knight. What the fuck's an opossum? Oh well, let's just put some goggles on him. Yeah, I suppose so. Let's take this to its logical conclusion. Perfect. Anyway, the game itself is just so good. It's constantly using the core mechanics in new and different ways to keep the experience feeling buried, and it never feels like it's dragging on. Controlling Sparkster is responsive, the graphics are great, the music is some of Konami's best ever, the whole package is just phenomenal. So while Mega Drive owners got to enjoy Rocket Knight as a platform, Platform exclusive, SNES owners also got a cork of a game. This is Pop and Twinbee, the next game in the Twinbee series and is the epitome of the cute em up style of shooting game. Licking a Switch cartridge tastes like chemicals and cancer, but I'd wager that this cartridge tastes like sugar and kawaii. A graphically over the top shooting game that is not very difficult and is probably more fun because of it. The hyper happy graphics don't sit still and always hitting you with something new. The bosses are not a huge challenge, but are still fun to play. This is about as far away from Dark Souls as a video game can be, yet it's still really enjoyable. <laughs> Two 
What you're seeing now is Konami's football game. Perfect eleven. This is the first in the winning eleven series of games. In the West, Konami keeps changing its mind on what to call the football series. At first, it was International Superstar Soccer. Then it was Pro Evolution Soccer. Then that was shortened to just PES. Now Konami have just said, "Fuck it." It's called all those things at the same time. So here's eFootball PES 2021 Pro Evolution Soccer. But Perfect 11 is the first game in the series. It's football. There's not that much more to say about it. So let's move over to the more interesting release of 1994, and that's Snatcher on the Mega CD. Now, I do realise it was out on the NEC, PC, MSX2, and PC Engine before this, but it was the Mega CD version that was the first and only official version to get released outside of Japan. So for most of the world, it was this version that people got to see. Another game from the creative tempest of Hideo Kojima's crazy brain. And Snatcher is a story-driven adventure game where you interact with the world around you using the given commands at the bottom of the screen. Although by today's standards, this might seem limiting, it does still feel like you are able to interact with many of the elements the game presents you. Unlike Kojima's later games, the story in this game is actually good and really does drive you to advance the, in the game to see where it will take you. Don't attempt to buy this game now because you'll just have to sell a kidney to a backstreet doctor to be able to afford it. Just download it from a website like CD Romance. That might not be totally within the law, but fuck it. Over a grand to play a game that's over 30 years old is bullshit. <laughs> This year, Konami put out two cult classics. The first being the PS1 game Sukhoiden, a classically styled, turn-based, story-driven JRPG. By today's standards, it's fairly stock and almost generic like roleplay, but it's the enjoyable world and colourful characters, and I think that simplicity plays into the charm of the game. There are no overly complex systems to learn, no need for an hour's worth of tutorial levels, just boot it up and get stuck in straight away, which is what retro games should all be about, even when they're a long form RPG. If you like RPG games and haven't played this, it's got some real old school charm that makes it worth a playthrough. The other game from this year is a real niche Japanese only dating simulator called Tokamiki Memorial. 1995 is when this PS1 version was released, although it was actually a remake of a game that came out of the PC Engine. It was this version that really put this series on the Japanese map. Unlike most other dating games, you don't just have to choose from multiple choice answers on what to say to people. You actually need to choose activities to skill up your character, which will affect which dialogue comes up. There are little mini games you need to play, and all this adds up to something that's actually far deeper than most other games of the genre. Although, unless you can read Japanese, this game is going to be an uphill struggle. <laughs> Two or three good games from one publisher in a year is great going. In 1996, Konami put out five absolute fucking bangers. We'll start with the arcade hit GTI Club Rally, a great little arcade racer that had you beaming around in minis and hot hatches. The courses were full of hills, handbrake turns and secret paths. Controls are tight, the music really sets the mood and the graphics are on point. Many years later, this game did get a PS3 remake as a digital download, but it's long been since delisted, so good luck with that shit. Next, we have the PS1 version of Hideo Kojima's Police Nauts. Yep, cops in space, although most of the game is actually played on Earth. Again, this game did actually come out on different platforms before the PS1 release, but as almost everyone in the world had a PS1, this is the version that most of the public actually saw. Well, I say most of the public, but this game never left Japan. And although you are looking at an English version here, this is a fan translated version that I've downloaded and stuck on my hacked PS3. As far as the game goes, it's like Snatcher in that you select your action from the menu of commands, but now you can point and click on items and people shown in the image window to interact with them. The story is just as good as Snatcher, although this time it's quite a lot darker. You have shooting sections alongside the point and click stuff, as well as a lot of anime video sequences. It's a great game and well worth downloading the translated ISO. The next game is Sexy Parodius. What's sexy about it? I'm not sure, unless you've got some sort of weird ideas about Call on the Cob. What this actually is, is a new Parodius game with even nicer graphics and a harder difficulty level. 
and more Barodius is always a good thing. Now we have international track and field. Yes, an updated version of the 1983 classic that we saw earlier, but now on the PS1. All the classic events return, but now in stunning 3D. Well, about as stunning as 3D could get in 1996. This was a really enjoyable game, but throwing a multi-tap and some friends, and you've got yourself one of the best multiplayer games around. One nice little Easter egg was that the save file icon was actually the OG sprite from the first first game. It's a shame they didn't do a proper 3D model of him in game though really. The last really fantastic game that Konami put out this year was Vandal Hearts on the PS1. Take an isometric strategy turn based battle system and throw in a ton of JRPG elements and you've just cooked yourself up a fresh plate of Vandal Hearts. This is another game that's getting expensive in the second hand market so you'll have to download an ISA because for some reason Sony refuses to sell digital PS1 games for modern Playstations. The more Another game literally everyone on the internet has covered a million times before is Castlevania Symphony Night for the PS1. It came out in 1997 and it was brilliant. That's all I really need to say because this one has been talked about to death, but it really is worth the bucket loads of jizz that everyone fires all over it. Let's get the obvious one out of the way first, Metal Gear Solid on the PS1. This is another one I don't want to talk about much because it's a waste of time. Yes, it's a great game, but again, it's been covered by everyone already, and you probably played it, so I'd just be wasting my time. Bishy Bashy, now there's something worth talking about. Konami took a whole load of acid, then got to work on designing mini games. Then they got those mini games, slammed them all into one title, called it Bishy Bashy, and proceeded to pass out on the floor in a pool of their own vomit and piss. Don't let any of this talk about piss sway you away from playing this game. It's great fun with friends, but if you want to have a bishy bashy alone, you can do that too. Now, some of you might dismiss Dance Dance Revolution as casual trash. Something you can't do is ignore how fucking huge this game was in the late 90s. Everyone had a dance mat at home, and every arcade had this game, which was surrounded by a gang of teenage girls. Obviously, true OG players know that the best way to play this game is with the official Konami dance controller. That way you could still bust the move in your front room without moving an inch. I'm genuinely surprised that Konami have not tried to bring this to a new generation of players. A USB dance mat and new songs as a constant stream of DLC seems like a no-brainer to me. Finally this year, Konami released pop and music. You may not have heard of this series, but trust me, it's very popular with well over 30 different titles which have still been released to this day. But 1998 saw the first release in the arcade and to the PS1 shortly after. So what is pop and music? It's a rhythm action game. This is the controller you get. And you have to press the right button in time with a falling marker on the screen. A simple but fun game which features such hit songs as I Really Want To Hurt You and a fun cast of characters to play against makes this a surprisingly fun game. Although it didn't really see many releases outside of Japan and that's probably why no one has ever spotted that the save game PS1 icons for both this and Parappa the Rapper are perfectly in sync. Silent Hill was Konami's response to the huge sales that Capcom received for its Resident Evil games, but this was equally as great. You know what this is, you travel to the town of Silent Hill and have to navigate the foggy town, battle weird monsters and find out just what the hell is happening. A fantastic game that used the limitations of the PS1 hardware to create a brilliant atmosphere. Here is where we end the video. Metal Gear Solid 2 was one of the best games on the PS2, but it also marked the end of Konami's stellar run of content. Yes, this is a good game, and you know all about what this is. But from here on out, Konami stopped putting out genre-defining OG titles and fell into the routine of sequels and rehashing IPs. This 20-year run had been filled with superb titles that gamers will remember forever. It's a shame it had to end here, but like this video, it had to end somewhere. Ah, uh, bah. <laughs>